And uh, our first speaker today is Maria, who defended her PhD in 2016 at uh, ETH Zurich. She did her postdoc at Yale University and EMBO in Heidelberg and was an SNSF and AXA Research Fund postdoctoral fellow. She joined the EMBO as a group leader last October. Uh, her research combines computational modeling and integration of multi-omics data to study how microbes adapt to their environment and how metabolic adaptations of individual bacteria shape the functional outcome of uh, the communities and their interactions with the environment. Thank you, Maria. Uh, the floor is yours. Um, thanks a lot again for, for the intro. Um, as Nelson said, I am um, just started my group at EMBL Heidelberg in October, and today I'm happy to talk about our efforts on quantifying gut microbiota contribution to the host metabolism of medical drugs and dietary compounds. We are born practically sterile, and throughout our life, we encounter microorganisms that live in and on us from the people we interact with, the food we consume, and the environment we live in. Healthy human body harbors hundreds to thousands of microbial species, the majority of which live in the gut. Gut bacteria collectively encode almost 100 times more genes than the human genome. And recent advances in sequencing technology allow us to estimate the diversity of gut bacteria and also link it to different aspects of human health, such as digestion, development of immune system, mental health, but also onset of metabolic diseases metabolism of medical drugs, and processes associated with aging. In my research, I'm mainly focusing on the mechanisms of host microbiota interactions, specifically focusing on metabolites or exchange of small molecules within the microbiota and be between microbes and the host. And today I'm gonna to walk you through two projects that I was involved before, where we try to address the question of how much bacteria can contribute to the host metabolism and how common bacterial contribution to the host metabolism can be. So to answer the first question, we focused on microbiota contribution to the host metabolism of medical drugs. Many medical drugs are taken orally so they can encounter gut microbiota in the host and drugs are also convenient uh, experimental system because they're produced neither by the microbes nor by the host. So they can be introduced in a more controlled way and measured in the system. In this project, we focused on one specific drug, brevodine, which is an antiviral compound that can be converted to a potentially toxic metabolite from a uracil or BVU, both by the host and by the microbes. And we first con confirmed experimentally um, that this is indeed the case uh, when we incubated uh, drug brevodine with uh, human or mouse liver assays or human and mouse gut contents we saw that in both cases, the drug was consumed and the BVU product was produced both by the host and by the microbes. So next we asked whether this microbial metabolism of brevogen also plays a role in vivo. To answer this question, we used the uh, notobiotic mouse models. So we can take mice that are completely sterile and compare uh, drug metabolism in these animals to conventionally raised mice that harbor native microbiota. So when we administered brevodin uh, to uh, these two groups of mice, we found that there were much larger levels of their drug in the large intestine of the germ-free mouse shown here in orange and much higher levels of the potentially toxic drug metabolite bromovenyluracil in the serum of colonized mice, suggesting that the presence of microbes in the gut affected uh, drug and metabolite kinetics in different mouse organs. So our next goal was to quantify these processes. And to do so, we decided to model drug metabolism processes in vivo. So when drug enters the body, it can be either absorbed from small intestine into systemic circulation, where it can be metabolized by the host and eliminated from the system, or it propagates down the gastrointestinal tract and gets secreted with feces. We described the, each of these processes with their differential equation, uh, which gave us a system of ordering differential equations, which we could uh, fit to solve the parameters based on our data. 
So here, for example, the concentration of drug in the serum is proportional to the absorption from small intestine, uh, host drug metabolism, and elimination of this drug from systemic circulation. The drug that enters large intestine of colonized mice can be in turn encountered by the microbiota, um, and these microbes in the gut can convert drug to, this meta to its product uh, metabolite, and this metabolite can be either absorbed into systemic circulation or propagate down, down the gastrointestinal tract. We used the data from germ-free mice to estimate the parameters of host drug metabolism and only intestinal data from colonized mice to estimate the parameters of microbial drug metabolism. And as a result, this model allowed us to predict how much of microbial produced metabolite will be absorbed into systemic circulation. And together with the estimate of post-produced drug metabolism that we get from the model for the germ-free mice, we found that our model explains the differences that we saw in the toxic metabolite level between colonized and germ-free mice and allows us to quantify that in this case, microbes contributed 70% to their toxic metabolite exposure in the mouse. So to summarize this part, um, I showed you that um, we had an experimental setup that allowed us to separate host and microbiota metabolism in vivo. And this data allowed us to build a dynamic pharmacokinetic model that explicitly in, incorporates microbiota drug metabolism and describes both host and bacterial interactions um, in the animal. And this model allowed us to quantify that bacteria can substantially contribute to the toxic drug metabolism process in the body. In the second part of my talk, um, I will um, walk you through an ongoing project that uh, looks away from the drugs and tries to estimate how common microbial contribution to the host metabolism can be in the context of diet. In this project, uh, we designed a controlled diet experiment where we took two groups of mice, germ-free mice that are completely sterile and mice that were germ-free but which we colonized with a synthetic community of 40 common, common human gut representatives. And we exposed each of these groups of mice to either high carbohydrate diet shown here in blue or high fat diet shown here in orange. After four days on either of the diet, we collected metabolomic samples along the gastrointestinal tract of the mice and also data and also samples for sequencing, metagenomics and metatranscriptomic sequencing from the gut of colonized mice. With untargeted metabolomics, we measured uh, more than 20,000 ions across different mouse tissues, which we could annotate to about 3,500 compounds from CAC and HMDB databases. So the first question we asked was, how were metabolites distributed across the gastrointestinal tract? To answer this question, we normalized the metabolite abundance along the six sections of the gastrointestinal tract that we, um, that we collected. So three sections in the small intestine, duodenum, jejunum, and ileum, and three sections in the large intestine, cecum, colon, and feces. And we performed unsupervised k-means clustering of this normalized metabolite profiles. And what we found was that uh, there were six clusters arising from this um, analysis uh, that um, each of this cluster could be uh, characterized by peak intensity in one of the six sections that we collected. And here are just some examples of representatives of each of the clusters. For example, an amino acid tyrosine um, was coming from cluster one with the highest abundance in duodenum, or a cholic acid tyrolitocholate uh, was representative of cluster three with the highest intensities in jejunum and cecum. And we performed this clustering independently from the data from each of the four groups of mice and found that in each group, the same six clusters arose. So now we wanted to characterize what are the different types of metabolites that fall into different clusters and do they um, differ between the mouse groups? So here we performed um, chemical group enrichment analysis of metabolites that fall into each cluster. Uh, and then uh, we performed um, hierarchical clustering uh, of this enrichment results. And what we found is that um, their uh, clusters um, were coming from different mouse groups were actually 
um, metabolize from the same mouse groups for clustering together, uh, meaning that um, it, independent of the diet or mouse colonization state, the same types of metabolites had the same in distribution along the gastrointestinal tract. For example, in the first cluster with the highest intensity in duodenum, we found uh, amino acids, peptides, purine nucleosides, fatty acids that are likely coming from the diet. Uh, in the third cluster, for example, that is peaking in jejunum and ileum, we found um, bile acids and steroidal glycosides that are known compounds that are produced by the host and secreted into small intestine to aid digestion. So the next question we asked was whether there are differences or within each cluster between the four mouse groups and whether we can quantify host and microbiome contributions to metabolite profiles. So although in the four mouse groups, metabolites having had the same uh, spatial distribution along the gastrointestinal tract, we still found large differences uh, within each tissue. For example, here um, for the metabolite lysine, there were no clear differences between the mouse groups, but for this metabolite in the middle, um, this abundance was much higher in the large intestine of germ-free mice highlighted with pale colors, uh, and this metabolite porphobilinogen was much more abundant in the intestine of colonized mice highlighted with solid colors. So to describe the distribution of metabolites along the gastrointestinal tract, uh, we developed a coarse grain metabolic flux model that assumed a pseudo steady state, uh, which uh, means that the concentration of metabolite in each tissue is um, not changing over the time period we are looking at it. Um, and this concentration is affected uh, by seven major factors. One factor is intestinal flow, so the flow of um, the uh, metabolite matter throughout the gastrointestinal tract, uh, host uh, metabolism in small and large intestine, and microbiome metabolism in large intestine, where host and metabolite and, and microbial metabolism can be diet dependent. So we describe the concentration of um, each of this metabolite in each tissue with a series of ordinary differential equations, which under the steady state assumption become just a system of linear equation, which we can solve for the factors that we consider in our model. And then we can interpret these factors, which I will show you on the next slide. So for example, for leucine, our modeling approach um, revealed that the main contributing factors to uh, leucine profile were host absorption from the small intestine as indicated here by negative coefficients um, of small intestine, both in high carbohydrate and high fat diets, suggesting that this metabolite is likely coming from the diet as host is absorbing it in the small intestine. For 5-aminolivulinate, um, although um, host absorption from the small intestine was also the main contributor to its profile, we also had a substantial contribution of Host potential host uh, production and microbial consumption of this metabolite in the large intestine that would explain the differences that we see uh, in the colon cecum and feces. And finally, for porphobilinogen, the coarse grain modeling approach would predict that both microbes and host are producing this metabolite in the large intestine, which explains the differences that we see between the three mouse groups. So with this coarse grain modeling approach, uh, we applied it to uh, almost 2000 metabolites that we detected um, along the gastrointestinal tract. And then we uh, performed hierarchical clustering of the metabolite, uh, of the coefficients, coefficient profiles for each of this metabolite um, that allow us to estimate the major contributing factor to each of these metabolite profiles. And you see the final results here. So with this approach, we could quantify that for about 40% of metabolites that we detect in gastrointestinal tract, the major contributing factor was host absorption from the small intestine, suggesting that these metabolites are mainly contributed by the diet. About uh, one third of metabolites were produced by the host, either in the large intestine or in the small intestine. And about 15% of metabolites could potentially be directly contributed by the microbes as the microbial positive metabolism coefficient was the largest contributing factor to its 
profile along the gastrointestinal tract. So next we asked whether we can link metabolite changes to microbial activity in the gut, since we also measured uh, metagenomics and metatranscriptomics uh, samples from the colonized mice. And here uh, we focused on uh, microbial associated metabolites. So metabolites with a substantial negative microbial coefficient that are, uh, we classified as potential microbial substrates and metabolites with a positive microbial coefficient, which we classified as potential microbial products. So to connect potential substrates to potential products, we used uh, genome scale uh, KEK enzymatic networks to find potential metabolic paths connecting substrates and products. And here I will show you an example where a potential substrates glutamate can be converted to potential product citrulline in arginine biosynthesis pathway. And this is a snapshot of a CAC pathway and the colored enzymes here indicate enzymes that were differentially abundant between the two groups of mice that were um, consuming two different diets. And then we can look in our synthetic community which microbes contributed most to the expression of this uh, of enzymes from this pathway. And for this example, uh, arginine and proline metabolism was more active in representatives of bacteroidetes species, suggesting that they might be the main contributors of the differences in uh, metabolite levels that we detected between the different mouse groups. We also found cases of a single enzyme connecting potential substrates to potential product. For example, here, potential substrate 5 aminolivulinate can be connected to potential product porphobilinogen by a single microbial enzyme porphobilinogen synthase. And then we looked at the expression of this enzyme in our synthetic community and found with that uh, representatives of firmicute bacteria had the highest correlation between this enzyme abundance and uh, its enzymatic product porphobilinogen abundance in the gut. And as you can see from this scatter plot, porphobilinogen abundance plotted on the y-axis correlated both with the relative abundance of Clostridium syndens and with the relative expression of porphobilinogen synthase from Clostridium syndens, suggesting that this microbe can indeed be the major contributor to the differences that we see in porphobilinogen abundance between the two diets. So to summarize this part, I showed you that um, our untargeted metabolomics combined with unsupervised clustering allow, allowed us to identify stable in vivo tissue distributions um, along the gastrointestinal tract that are largely diet and microbiome presence independent. However, uh, we saw large differences uh, between metabolite abundance within each tissue and then coarse grained intestinal flux model allowed us to estimate uh, diet host and microbiome contributions to these metabolites and classify them as uh, mostly diet, mostly host, and mostly microbiome associated. And finally, integrating metatranscriptomics data sets and metagenomics data uh, with our metabolite classification allows us to potentially identify which bacterial species are the likely contributors to different metabolite abundance in the gut. So here I would like to um, acknowledge my two postdoctoral labs where I uh, did most of this work and um, uh, spe specifically Andy Goodman lab at Yale University where all the mouse work was done um, and also Per Borg at lab at EMBL Heidelberg where I did my second postdoc and my funding sources. Um, and of course, um, I also want to acknowledge and advertise my newly established lab at EMBL um, and my, my group of um, courageous people who joined me on our journey to combine modeling and multi-omics integration approaches to elucidate bacterial metabolism, understand interactions in microbial communities, and potentially quantify microbiota host interactions in vivo. So with this, I thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Maria, for this very nice presentation with lots of data. So whoever wants to do any question, please open the mic and go for it. There is a question from Schwert. Yannick, go for it. Uh, am I, can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, it's kind of a little bit maybe out of the real topic. Um, 
right in the introduction, you said uh, you, you were talking about the organism starting almost germ-free, with a which is like referring to the sterile womb theory. Um, how, how present is it in the current studies? Because I know there's a lot of discussion going on about if the uh, offspring is really without any uh, germs or, for example, if we ha already have a transfer of bacteria through placenta uh, tissue. Um, the same goes, are there plans to maybe work after such an experience with the uh, with a F1 generation to see how the composition and how the nutrient uh, or metabolic uh, distribution is in their gut? Um, thanks for your question. So I'm, I, I'm not sure I understand the second part. So you mean F1 generation of mice and compare the metabolism in their gut to metabolism of their parents or what yes, is your if you, for, if you, for example, do this uh, study uh, and, and then see if uh, there's any connection to the uh, parental uh, feeding not only because of methylation, but maybe also because of transmission of uh, the microbiome from, for example, the mother to the offspring. Yeah, so uh, yeah, okay, Thank, thanks for, for the two questions. So to answer the first question, I'm not an um, expert on uh, placental microbiome, and I think it's uh, still a topic uh, of, uh, of a lot of debates, but uh, at least in our experiments, the whole um, experimental model of germ-free mice, and it shows you that, um, you know, there, the fact that we can make germ-free mice means that uh, they were sterile in the womb. Um, but there is definitely a potentially interaction between parental microbiome and, um, and the baby, it can be maybe through metabolites potentially. Um, I don't have um, ongoing uh, plans to do uh, research in that direction, but uh, there are definitely groups looking at how um, how parental microbiome or par parental feeding uh, or exposure exposure of parents to different environmental um, different env environmental factors affect the offspring um, and. Um, um, I can refer you to some papers, but I'm definitely not the expert on that. Okay. Luis? Yeah, thanks. Hi, very nice talk. I have a question. You said that one, one third, so the bacteria con contribute to one third of the metabolites in the gut. Uh, but this is, uh, uh, it, it contributes to one third of different metabolites that exist in the gut. How does that uh, relate to the amount biomass or mass of metabolites, how much is transformed by the, by the microbiome? Yeah, I mean, this is a, a very good uh, question. And of course, I mean, I said, I mean, it's our interpretation of the modeling framework that we use to classify metabolites. So we, of course, the, we have to be careful because the fact that, you know, the model estimates the microbial factor being the main contributor to metabolite doesn't directly mean that microbes produce this metabolite. It can be that microbe affect the host in a way that it produces more in microbial presence. So I would say my microbe associated metabolites are the ones that are more or less present in the colonized mice compared to germ-free mice. Um, I haven't actually looked at their um, relative abundance of like the relative abundance of metabolites between each other. Um, and unfortunately our data is not quant quantitative so we don't have absolute concentrations. But yeah, I mean, that's, that's of course a, um, a very important point to think about moving further of can microbes actually, can microbes produce large enough amounts of metabolite that they're, um, affecting the host. Thanks. 
Ok, Paul. Hi, Maria. Nice Hi, to see Paul. you. Nice uh, to see great, you. Great, great talk. Um, I was wondering um, the example you showed of a metabolite that can be linked and depleted uh, to bacterial activity was glutamate. Uh, a, a priori, that's like a simple metabolite that uh, you would not always expect, or like you expect the host to as well be interested in in consuming it. I was wondering if you if you found more cases like this, uh, or like in terms of metabolite classes that uh, are surprisingly left by the host to the microbiome? Yeah, I mean, that's that's a, a very good question. And I mean, I'm, I'm currently looking at, you know, character, I mean, this is still ongoing. Um, so, you know, ca characterizing what are the classes of metabolites that are in uh, each of these different clusters. And I mean, there are some surprisingly simple metabolites that we find and I mean, I mean, glutamate is of course like a very common metabolite, right? But what we see in the data, at least, is that um, the glutamate levels are higher in germ-free mice compared to colonized mice. So there is definitely some effect of microbial presence on glutamate levels. Why there are glutamate levels in, in the large intestine of the host does not just use it up uh, that's a different question. Um, so another common class of metabolites are, for example, nucleosides. Um, surprisingly, uh, it seems like uh, they there are available to the microbes to be consumed in the gut. Okay, well, I would not expect it. Thanks. Uh, can I ask just a quick follow-up or not follow-up, but related? Uh, I, I thought it was quite impressive that you could link uh, two metabolites directly only one enzyme away, right? It's like this poor for, sorry, weird name. Uh, I was wondering why is the conversion like specially separated at least? You could see degradation mainly happening in the small intestine, but the increase is happening in the column or at least starting in the second. Is there any yeah. explanation for this? So my interpretation is that, I mean, it's also the case with glutamate, so that these metabolites are actually more abundant in the small intestine. So, you know, here um, you see they're more abundant in the small intestine, but then there is still uh, some residual abundance in the large intestine of germ-free mice that are in pale colors. And in conventional mice, there is basically, it's basically gone. Um, so my interpretation is that it's either like a di diet associated compound that, you know, the host is absorbing from the small intestine. And then there are some leftovers that are just going down with fecal matter and host cannot uh, absorb it in the large intestine because uh, of the different physiology of the large intestine compared to small intestine. So if microbes are there, then they would convert it to uh, porphyrinogen in the large intestine where they are present in high abundances. Um, so it's basically so so they 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 are working on the residual porphyrinogen that's not fully consumed by the host in the small intestine. That would be my interpretation. Yeah, makes sense. Okay, thanks. Okay, Pedro. Hi, Maria. Um, very nice talk. Uh, I have a follow-up question, I think, from Luis as well. So you are not able to discriminate between the metabolites that come directly from the bacteria or from the host upon colonization by bacteria. So my question there is that, have you ever done RNA-seq on the host side to see what are the different signaling patterns that might be triggered about the colonization by different bacteria that then can help you to predict what are the metabolites that, that are being produced by, by those um, so have you done that? Because you did transcriptomics, right? But it was just on the yeah, bacteria only on side bacteria. Or... Okay. Yeah. No, that's that's a very good point, and we were we were thinking about looking at host expression. Um, we don't have this data from this experiment, but we're thinking about it, like looking forward to when we design future studies, that it would be good to look at um, mm. to try to see whether host expression is affected by microbes, and we can disentangle even more. What are the microbial associate? Where are the microbial associated metabolites coming from? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Very good point. Thank you, Maria. Thank you very much for this very nice presentation. Thank you. Uh